You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Kenneth Ibom, and on today's show, we'll discuss expectations for Niger President Buhari's second term in office. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets. You can also follow my handle, at Kenneth Ibomo. Now, Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari says his administration achieved success against Boko Haram in the first four years. My guest today joined me to explore what to expect in the next phase of his time in office. Twin Sani, the group CEO of Emerging Africa Capital, Taiwan Daily Partner, and West Africa Tax Leader at PwC Nigeria, and JJ Tomi, the principal partner at JJ Tomi Partners. They all join me for this conversation. Thank you again once again for joining me on the show today. But let me first start first by talking about, you know, when you look at the last four years and you look at how much growth we, we recorded, looking at first at the economy. Um, and um, Tony, I'd like you to speak first on our moves um, at diversifying the economy of Nigeria. Well, um, as um, we must admit, um, the economy is relatively diversified. Um, the challenge always is the source of government income, which remains still significantly um, dependent on oil and gas revenues. Be that as it may, there is plenty of room for further diversification. And um, one of the areas that I would love to see Nigeria take up the opportunity more is to explore the opportunity for our youths in the digital economy. Um, I think that um, with um, deliberate policy on the government side to encourage continued investments in technology, and of course also to encourage um, more study in STEM fields for um, our youth, both boys and girls. I think there is room when we have um, an economy that is made up or we have a population that is made up predominantly of young persons as we see across sub-Saharan Africa. The government has to be a merchant of hope. Government has to be a vehicle that enables and encourages these young persons to see the opportunities that are significant in these spaces and to pursue them. So in terms of policies that would make it easier, and by the way now I'm going into more of having an inclusive um, economy and not all forms of inclusion, including financial inclusion. So policies that will make it easier, for example, for our entrepreneurs who are increasingly young persons and women to be able to access funding so again, we now need to look at our interest rate policy and see whether or not we can better manage interest rates to make, um, and, and beyond um, interest rates, all forms of inclusion and financial inclusion, which also includes reforms that we need to make, for example, in the mo mobile money space to generally make it easier for the young persons and the women, including women in the rural areas, to access financial services so that they can contribute effectively to the economy. These are areas where we can diversify the economy more. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I'll, I'll leave it for Very you. interesting contributions. Let me bring the tax money into this one, Taiwo, and look at how we are trying to generate revenues. In, you know, going into the looking first back at the last four years, you know how we've performed on you know the initiatives we tried out and things that worked, didn't, the ones that didn't work, the ones that need to be improved on. When you look at how we are, you should go into the next four years, you know, I like to look at how I like to get hear, hear your thoughts on how you think we should handle things going forward. Yeah, thank you. I think the biggest uh, accomplishment for me, um, looking back. The past four years will be the new national tax policy. Uh, maybe it's no longer new. It was approved in 2017, okay. uh, which pretty much set the tone for the direction in which we want to go as a country from the fiscal side. Uh, but again, like people would say, you know, a good plan is only as good as the paper on which it's written. If you haven't implemented, you don't see the impact. Um, we also had a few efforts and initiatives to try and bring more people into the tax net by way of tax amnesties. Uh, first, it was the voluntary uh, asset and income declaration scheme, and then now we have the VOAS, the Voluntary Offshore Asset Regulation Scheme. Uh, a bit of progress in terms of creating more awareness, but bringing people to, into the task net and raising more revenue wasn't anywhere as close as the target that the government had set. We have seen a lot of efforts by the Federal Inland Revenue Service uh, trying to collaborate with the state authorities uh, to ensure that uh, in the way they go about trying to enforce taxes is more uh, consistent and, and also um, 
you know, reducing the, the cost of compliance and the complexity. We moved up um, about 11, 12 places on the ease of paying taxes. Uh, so these were bits of uh, positives. In terms of the expectations, um, I think the way we go about taxes, we need to recognize, and I like to say this always, that taxes are the way uh, government collects from the share in the prosperity of people and businesses. So if people are not doing well, you can make money from collecting taxes. The Nigeria Economy Summit Group conducted a study recently which found out that about 67% uh, of Nigerians don't trust government. Uh, and if you don't trust government, you don't want to pay taxes to them. And in fact, that's even worse at the state level, local government, as well as even tax officers. So we need to do things differently. Um, some of the amendment bills that were done to reform the tax system uh, were not even presented to the National Assembly. I think, again, because of the relationship between the Assembly uh, and the Executive. So we need to fix all of this going forward and ensure that we have an alignment between fiscal policy and monetary policies. Right, and um, getting that alignment between fiscal monetary and poli monetary policy. George, let me bring you in here. On, on your side, I would like to still speak on growth, but on this side, because we've heard Tony talk about the need to diversify, we also heard Ty will talk about you know how the government should you know increase its revenue generation strategies. But then, when you look at the project and plans that the government has for the future, the government can't really fund that uh, you know all, all that from its coffers alone. The government is going to definitely look at borrowing borrowing money. I'd like to, you to speak on how the government has gone about you know. Is debt, the, the government's debt strategy so far in the past four years, and how you think this should evolve going forward? One of the um, reasons why people keep talking about diversification of the economy is just simply to uh, widen the income base of the country. Uh, this over dependence on one product with all its volatility is what gives this uncertainty regarding our income flow. As a result, we resort to borrowing. And uh, in many cases, not as cheap as it would appear. And um, I'm sure when the Minister for the Budget gives the budget details, you will find that close to 50% of our income is going to go on debt servicing. Now, that's a very high proportion in any, any time, any day. So what do you have left for your capital projects? Uh, considering that recurrent expenditure is going to gobble uh, just about all the things. So we really don't have a choice, but begin to look how we can widen the income base. The tax regime is one way that's been done. It's not met its projected targets. But again, we must be careful uh, what we do with that. It's the same people that are being taxed in different forms. Uh, they are creating employment on the, of their own. Uh, the social and uh, cultural system in Nigeria makes the, the, the haves, uh, <laughs> the supporters of the have-nots anyway. And many of those are not documented and they are the same people that are targeted. No matter how nicely you coin, the tax is the same people. So we must be careful not to, not to kill, as it were, the goose that lays the, the golden eggs. So we must uh, continue on a trajectory that says that if you borrow for consumption, it's a problem. But if you borrow to develop infrastructure, and we badly need that. I mean, it's, it's just a nightmare traveling in Nigeria in any form. Road, rail, in fact, the rails don't exist. Roads are in dilapidated conditions. Uh, we're talking about electricity. We're talking about, you know, the things that make the average human being function. So if you are borrowing for those, and I'm not saying government should run them, they're not good managers, borrow, do, and quickly come up with a program where they can rapidly be put in the hands of those who can run them, I think we'll be making a lot of progress. It's a bit scandalous to find that a city like Lagos, if we believe all the population projections, close to 20 million. It does not even have a proper mass transit system. It's how do you function? And this is in a, an economy that's a destination of its own, irrespective of whether or not it's in Nigeria, larger than most African countries, the economy of Lagos. And yet, it's, it's just a hassle. People spend five, six hours a day 
going to and from work because you don't have robust uh, mass transit system. So those are the things uh, should be the agen agenda for the, the new regime going forward. We just need to deal with this infrastructural growth. And if debt will help that, that's debt well incurred. But if it's just to uh, subsidize consumption. consumption, then there's a problem. All right, then. Very interesting points there. Let me now get to the angle of human capital development. You know, when you look at the stats around unemployment staggering, you look at poverty. A recent report I read just before this interview was talking about from the same world, um, world poverty clock. We brought out the horrible statistics earlier. Mm -hmm. They did a projection to 2030, and they're saying that, you know, by 2030, we're going to have about 120 million Nigerians living in extreme poverty. When I look at those stats, if nothing is done, you know, if, if things are left at current levels. And I look at the kind of work, it speaks to the kind of work that needs to be done to, to get more people working, to explore that productive economy from the young population in there. So you know, I'd like to get your, your input on this and you know, what we can do to get better outcomes from human capital development. Thank you. Um, sincerely, our greatest source of wealth is really our people. Um, and increasingly, the world is beginning to recognize that. And that's why you have nations like Canada that are actually going out of their way to attract these same people that, unfortunately, we are not giving you know, a sense of hope to. Um, if you look at um, the trend with respect to our budgeting, the, the areas that have the you know, lowest um, allocation relative to former um, period, unfortunately, our education and health. And um, we have a country that um, grossly under budgets in these critical you know, areas where um, a country like um, Ghana, with, um, which is um, a much smaller economy and much smaller population, is providing a much higher provision for you know, education and health. So it is very clear that unless our priorities change, we are destroying the asset that has the highest value for us. Um, we need to invest in a very deliberate and a consistent way in the health, the education, and the well-being of our people. Um, we need to um, focus on education in the STEM space, um, that is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And we need to provide incentives for our young persons um, to um, follow those disciplines. We also need to leverage digital technology for there to be access to quality education for our young persons um, and thus bridging the, the, the challenges with the infrastructure. Um, of course, addressing our huge power deficit is also critical because you can't have um, good education, you can have good health services if you cannot even access electricity. Let's go to a quick break right now, you know, and then when we come back, we'll continue our conversations and then we'll you know, tackle that area of human capital development, which I think is, sits at the heart of everything that we're trying to discuss here. I've been speaking to Toin Sani, she's the Group CEO of Emerging Africa Capital. I also have Taiwo Yedele, uh, is the partner and West Africa tax leader at PwC Nigeria, and Georgie Tomi, is the principal partner at Georgie Tomi Partners. Welcome back to Beyond Markets. If you're just joining us, we're looking at what to expect from the next four years from President Buhari's administration. My guests are Toyin Sani, she's the group CEO of Emerging Africa Capital, Taiwo Yedele is the partner and West Africa tax leader at PwC Nigeria, and Jade Etomi, who is the principal partner at George Etomi and Partners. Taiwo, before we left off, Toyin was giving some very interesting views on, on how we should, you know, move the needle for human capital development. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, indeed. Uh, we have to always acknowledge and recognize that our people would always be our greatest assets. Even at this time, um, if you look at it from a very basic viewpoint that Nigeria makes more money in terms of foreign exchange receipts from diaspora remittances than from selling crude oil. And this is us not even investing anywhere close where we should in our people. So if you think about it and you think about education, you think about health, uh, even vocational training as well, and government has to look at this from an outcome, impact, and resource point of view and not effort. Because sometimes we say, oh, how much is it that we've allocated to budget, uh, in the budget for education? How many schools have we built? We do not care about the quality of education 
and the impact we're making uh, on the society. So that, for me, it's key. And the other aspect is also just enabling people uh, to be able to do whatever they want to do. Nigeria has somewhere between 30 to 35 million micro and small businesses. These are people just trying to survive on their own. And life is very difficult from bad tax policies to regulations to extortion from non-state actors. We need to deal with that until you get to a point where someone who wants to work hard and sweat is rewarded by the system that the person who wants to commit a crime or the person who wants to go into fraudulent practices uh, or even somebody who wants to put money into government bonds. Uh, I was saying to my wife recently, small investment that we put together for her, that if I had put this into government bond and treasury bills, would have made far more money than putting up a business where she employs about 15 people. And the government investment is tax free and this one is not. And every next minute, someone appears from local government, from state, from federal. We have to fix that. Without addressing that, unemployment will not go down. And that's a time bomb. I do not think anybody should sleep with their two eyes closed until we address this problem of unemployment and human capital development. All right, uh, George, let me bring you in this one, because we're looking at the young people in there. More young people in Nigeria are more, are more you know, they're thinking about going to Canada, you know, leaving the shores of the country. Where, so we're having a brain drain at, at extreme proportions in the past two years. I'd like you to speak to what you think we can do first on getting, on, on, uh, getting the, solving that uh, unemployment problem and also tackling the poverty issue. Look, it is a pity that we're talking about security as almost a number one need as against human capital development. The vote for security far exceeds the vote for education. That gives you an idea of how far we have neglected our most important resource. There is no other way to do it. You have to go back to the basics. We have lost in some parts of Nigeria close to two generations of active people who could have been educated and made better citizens, but instead are resorting to crime. So some states are going back to where it should, we should be, primary school, basic education. If you don't catch them at that point, it will be a big problem. Um, sometime, in 20, in, sometime in 2018, I went to, to Midugori, and I was guest of the governor as part of the NBA delegation that paid a visit to him. And this is the heartbeat of the crisis in the Northeast. And he just kept saying, George, all I will do is education, education, and even if you want to please me now, build a school for me. He's gotten it right. Same thing is happening in Edo State. They have this program called the Edo Best, where they've gone right back to the basics. Well, yeah, we've lost a few generations. Let's not lose more. Go back and stop the hemorrhage. So you begin to get good quality people. Sadly, all the good quality products of Nigeria are leaving, like you said, to other shores. Um, not that migration like that on its own should ordinarily not be bad. Once that sort of um, education or skill, it's fungible, it, 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 it can go around. Uh, because it brings you, like Taiwo said, a, a lot of uh, remittances and all that. But when it is like they are fleeing, and then you are now left behind with whatever you're left with, it, is, it, it has a direct negative impact on your economy. So we have no choice in this country. And please, it could be formalized, it could be informal. What we do now is anybody from your village, from your house help, your whatever, begin to teach them good habits, basically good habits. It doesn't have to be formal education. If you don't let these people understand that there is an alternative, then the new normal will become everything we call antisocial. And that is why I'm worried particularly for the young people. But having said that, the young Nigerian, I mean, blows my mind. What they have done in spite of government is just phenomenal. Look at what they're doing, like, um, uh, Taiwo said in sorry, Mrs. Sunny said in the in the in the digital space in this digital space. Look at the uh, entertainment space. Look at and this is without support, formal support. So the, the the potential exists. So we need to focus. Incidentally, yesterday was uh, Children's Day. The children are the future. 
we must focus on them and begin to teach them the right values. Sadly, in some cases, many of the good things that come out of these musicals and co, um, at times the messages can confuse you because it comes up with bits that mask the very dirty language at times that's used. So some of these things can be made uh, to be more positive. positive. Nigeria, on, a, on one note, African continental free trade area, we haven't signed up to it, but it's a huge market that's waiting for us. And you know what the, the brain basket of that market would be? Nigeria. Yeah, because Nigerians could drive. You know, they would drive it will, because knowledge, we are knowledge driven in this place. All right, I'd like to now get into one of the issues I also think is, you know, sits at the top of, you know, all that we've discussed. You know, John touched on it, on it a little when he started talking about, you know, you know where, we, where we're, we're leading our focus, and which is security. You know, and I'd like to you know, first start with Tony and get your thoughts on, you know, how, where, first, how we've performed on security in the, in the past four years. And, you know, without paying lip service, where we should see tangible outcomes, you know, on security so that people are, feel more, you know, you know, free to move around every part of the country without fear. So, thank you. I'm going to talk about the indirect factors that I think are fueling the insecurity. And the first one I'm going to talk about is poverty. Um, so, when you have high insecurity, the knee-jerk reaction is to buy lots of guns and put lots of, you know, military, you know, men on the streets and turn weapons upon your own people. But the smarter response is to sit down and identify what are the factors that are fueling this insecurity? What are the factors that are making our people more vulnerable to being um, converted to terrorism? So poverty, ignorance, so, and, and, and a sense of hopelessness. And so at the end of the day, we need to go back to the education and the infrastructure issues. So as you educate the people and invest in their health and well-being and effectively and positively communicate a message of hope to the people and engage the social, um, engage all the social platforms that are available to communicate with the people, including the community platforms, to give a message of hope, then you can effectively tackle the problem of insecurity. But I suspect that um, it's easier to simply allocate, throw money. Every time you have a problem, throw more money at it. And some people are happy to be the ones that are going to manage those huge votes that you are throwing in the direction of getting more guns and getting more boots on the ground. But you create bigger problems. And, and by the way, some of these allocations are such that once they've been made, nobody ever wants to have to make less. And so I think we are inadvertently creating a bigger problem for ourselves unless and until we turn around and, and begin to focus on, on what we should focus on, which is managing the root causes as opposed to managing the symptoms. All right, then. We have just two minutes on this show, and I'd like to hear Taiwo's contribution on this one, because when you look at it, we're seeing a lot of IDPs here and there, internally displaced people within the country. We're looking at, you know, scores of people not getting educated. We have one of the highest out-of-school children in there, and then you, you have areas in Nigeria that haven't had their full planting seasons in, in quite a while because of these insecurity issues. And now it's, it's even gone beyond Boko Haram. We're right. seeing now more, we're seeing issues of kidnappings here and there. The Femme Herda crisis still continues to ravage in different different parts of the country. Taiwo, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think we, we are very reactive as a country. So we wait for the crisis to be so obvious and in our faces before we even start to do anything about it. Until we get to a point where after identifying, and I do agree with Twain, what are the root causes? People just don't wake up one day and, and look for a bomb and blow up a place. So it, 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 it leads up, something leads to another. So once we begin to ad identify and deal with those fundamental root causes of poverty, ignorance, lack of opportunities, we also need to go beyond that to think about how can we reform our security architecture from the police to the military to the Navy, get them to work together. And also we have to deal with politicians who once 
things don't go their way. They have all the money to try around. Because even crime is not easy to commit. But they have all the money to fund all of that. Government must follow the money and make sure you block those people. Make it more difficult for them to fund crimes. And for those who already have done it, if you find out, they should face the consequences. It should not be a case that goes on for another 10 to 15 years. Until we deal with insecurity, nothing else will work in Nigeria. Unfortunately, like George said, this is now our primary focus and priority, and that shouldn't be. It should be focusing on people and how to get them to develop and grow. All right, then. Thank you so much for all your contribution on the show. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but very insightful contributions you've had on the show today, and we hope that, the, you know, as this keeps resonating across the country, you know, we'll see a much better next four years, you know, when the administration takes office. I've been speaking to Toyin Sani, she's the group CEO of Emerging Africa Capital. Also, Taiwo Oyedele is a partner and West Africa tax leader at PwC Nigeria, and George Etomi, who is the principal partner at George Etomi and Partners. And that's all from the Beyond Markets for today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time every day and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow me at Kennedy Bomo. Do have a wonderful day. <music>